afternoon students i'm miss josephine shangula your tutor for dppe and djp lsm 32. that is learning support in mathematics for both pre-primary education and junior primary education so welcome to the exam based contact classes and um, for 2019 so i would like us to start off with the instructions to candidates Please take note of these instructions and keep them at the back of your head as soon as you receive your exam script. Because there are a few instructions that you overlook and you end up being deducted because of not applying to the instructions or not adhering to the instructions. Number one, answer all the questions for 100 marks on the question paper. You answer all the questions there is no. Choose one of the two or choose two of the three. You answer everything. Then you use the mark allocation for each question as a guide for how many facts are needed. Please let the number of mark allocated guide you as to how much to answer. A 10 mark question. Do not state two sentences or list for 10 marks. If you are asked to list five items and you expect 10 marks from them. So look at the mark allocated for each question before you answer. Observe the thinking level of the verb. We do have verbs at the beginning of our modules. Please go through them as well. You observe the thinking level before you answer. That's also a guidance. Number your work correctly. The numbers should correlate with the question numbering. When you are answering, please, if it's 2.11, number your answer is 2.11. So Take note of your numbering. At the end of your exam, when you are done, go through your question paper just to make sure that you have numbered correctly. Neat and tidy work is required. Learning outcomes. This exam-based contact class is based on all the seven outcomes as per our module or syllabus. Now we have unit number one, which deals with approaches which support special needs learning general learning support in lessons for unit two and then unit three learning support for fundamentals unit four learning support for application of concepts and skills unit five learning support for concepts and operations and unit six issues of the mathematics environment and unit seven issues of assessment in mathematics please take note that from each learning outcome definitely you will come across a subtopic or two that will be covered in the exam. So make sure you go through every learning outcome for your examination. Unit one. Under unit one, we have those five topics listed there. The learning cycle, approaches to teaching and learning, methods to support different learning abilities, mathematical learning difficulties, and the language of mathematics. Please take note that from each subtopic, we have covered something one or two so we'll only cover here and there not everything as i've listed but here i just gave you as a guideline to know that under mathematical learning difficulty for instance what do you know from there go through and see what is important what is in your syllabus what should you cover make notes for yourself as well so i may not go through all five but please make sure you are not limited to my um presentation touch on every subtopic go through from each subtopic however i will highlight a few points from one or two from the learning cycle we have two approaches the constructivist approach and the traditional approach many students happen to misquote the two the constructivist approach is teaching with understanding approach it's known as a teaching with understanding that on its own should guide you as to be able to describe what the constructivist approach is. And the second approach we have is a traditional approach. This approach is the telling approach. It's no more teaching someone to understand the concept, but you are more or less telling them what something is instead of teaching and measure the understanding. Let's go back to constructivist approach. The theorists propose that children are not empty vessels to be filled with knowledge, but are rather active participants in the knowledge. Therefore, teachers should help learners to construct their own understanding of a concept. And this understanding should be based on what children already know. 
So you therefore first identify what the child already know before you build on what they already know. You are teaching someone to understand by measuring their prerequisite knowledge already. Let's look at the traditional approach. How is it different from the constructivist approach? And as I say, traditional is a telling approach. It assumes that learners learn best when they are given facts and then drilled on the facts they have been given. Remember, teaching or telling approach. Learners are expected to memorize facts. You are just telling them facts and they must memorize the facts without understanding. That is traditional approach. And we are to get away with the traditional approach in education. The learning that takes place is a road learning. Remember the different types of learning. Now, road, road learning more, it describes more of the traditional approach. The learning takes place, okay, no, uh, pardon me, one size fits all attitude is assumed. As I said, it's a road learning. So it's a one size fits all approach. There is no individualized teaching. If you have one particular method, you assume that all the learners will do well with that method instead of introduce all various methods so that each one individually, they pick what works best for them, what method, what formula works best for them. Instead, you give them a one size fits all. So what works best for this one should work best for everyone. We shouldn't do that as educators. Let's proceed. Under learning cycle, we have the importance of an understanding of the learning cycle for curriculum development and classroom teaching. What are those importance? Understanding of the learning cycle for the curriculum development and classroom teaching. Because when planning teaching activities, it is important to understand how children learn. That's an importance. It's important for the curriculum development because when planning teaching activities, it is very important to understand how children learn. You should know how they learn before you teach them something for them to learn. With an understanding of the stages that children go through as they learn, an effective curriculum planner, which is now you, the teacher, the educator, or teacher, can plan activities an effective curriculum planner or teacher can plan activities to reflect the natural stages that children go through when they learn something new. Let me repeat this one. With an understanding of the stages that children go through as they learn. Remember when children learn, there are stages of learning that they go through. Now with that understanding of such stages, an effective curriculum planner or teacher can plan activities to reflect the natural stages that children go through when they learn something new. Okay, we proceed. Children are less likely to have difficulties with a topic if they have gone through all the stages of the learning cycle when being introduced to that specific topic. They will definitely or they will be likely to have difficulties with a topic that they have already gone through all the stages of the learning cycle when you introduce a specific topic for them for the first time. Skipping stages, that's another importance. Skipping stages can be detrimental. What does that mean? It can be harmful to the learners. Learning and curriculum planners and teachers need to have a very good understanding of the learning cycle. You as a curriculum planner or as a teacher first need to have that understanding of the learning cycle so that you can know what will not harm the children or the learners that you are learning. To avoid from harming them with what you are, with what you are teaching them, first understand the learning cycle yourself as a curriculum planner. Still under unit one, let's look at the difference between the physiological and the psychological mathematic learning difficulty. Please take note of the two words. They may kind of sound the same, but they are very different in all ways. Physiological and psychological mathematical learning difficulties. In mathematics, we have specific learning difficulties, and they are classified or they are categorized. We have the physiological mathematical learning difficulties, and we have the psychological mathematic learning difficulties. Please, students, study the 
spelling as well of how to write these words. Do not confuse the two. Let's look at physiological. What is a physiological mathematic learning difficulty? It's a learning difficulty caused by physical ailment or physical damage. Physical damage, something on the body physically. It damages you, the, you, the damage is visible. That's a physiological learning difficulty. So it is caused by physical ailment or physical damage, such as brain damage. When your brain is damaged, something will still show visually, outside you'll still see. An example of such physical damage can be colorblind. When someone is colorblind, you'll see that this person is colorblind, or the person can see that I'm colorblind. It's something that can be ident identify identifiable by seeing that. Colorblind means if you tell learners to color three blocks blue and or how many blocks are colored in blue and how many blocks are colored in red. Now, a colorblind learner may not, may not be able to distinguish between the two colors, red and blue. They may all appear black to such a learner. That is something caused by physical damage and they end up being colorblind. So that is now physiological mathematical learning difficulty. It becomes a learning difficulty because this child cannot be able to work with colors. And it's caused by what? By physical damage. Let's look at psychological mathematical learning difficulty. What makes it now the psychological mathematical learning difficulty different from the physiological? Psychological is a learning difficulty that is caused by psychological blockage. Psychology is blocked by something, such as a behavioral or cognitive problem. Behavioral problem, examples of behavioral or cognitive problems are troubles. Maybe a child having a trouble remembering timetables. This child, psychologically, there is a blockage somewhere there. It's caused by what? Cognitive problems. And then this child cannot remember timetables. A child may be able to master within those 10 seconds that you teach them the table of a certain number and then immediately after 10 minutes, the child cannot remember the tables. That's a cognitive problem. Or not knowing where to start when solving weight problems. Child will look at the numbers, will not even have an idea. Where do I start when solving this problem? Let's proceed. The four common mathematical learning difficulties. Now, what are the th mathematical learning difficulties? The four common, four common. Remember, they were just classified under into two, two categories. Now, what are the four common mathematical learning difficulties? Children may experience at various stages of their schooling. We have the memory problems, we have the procedural problems, the visual spatial problems, and then we have the problem solving difficulties. I'll quickly just go through this. Memory problems. A child will have problems with remembering and we remem remem remembering of facts such as recalling names or numbers or names of numbers or symbols, anything that requires memory. This child will have trouble or we have problems with remembering. Or how to set up their own sums. They will not know how to remember. They cannot be able to remember that. So memory problems is learners with problems of remembering facts of names. It can be as simple as a name. A child will not be able to remember. Now, how you as a teacher, how do you assist such, such a learner? Teachers should base their teaching on understanding of concepts. If a child understands the concept well, a child, that concept will be able to help a learner remember the procedures or the facts or the symbols or the names just by understanding the concept. Secondly, a teacher can also make learning as, as much fun as possible. Introduce games, give rewards of stars or something. Make it enjoyable for them. Let them be involved. Let them do hands-on. Then at least they'll remember that this is what I did because we're doing it practically. So you try to make your lessons as much fun as possible. Procedural problems. These are children with problems of carrying out procedures. Have difficulty knowing how to start a sum, for instance, or remembering the steps for procedures. Take an example of long division. It have first, you multiply, you divide, you add, you subtract. Now, a child with a procedural problem will not know what to do first, how to carry out the procedures. 
the child will have such problems. What do I do first? Because the child lacks or the child is affected, have this learning difficulty of remembering procedures or how to carry out procedures when solving sums. Teachers, how do you now help learners if you identify a child having a procedure problem in your lesson? How do you assist or help such a learner to overcome such a problem? You introduce the concepts using a variety of methods, as I said. This child might have a problem or a procedural problem with your method that you prefer. But try to introduce as many methods as possible for this child to choose from what method works best for them. Because a child may have this procedural problem with one topic or with specific method, but surprisingly, you see that the child will perform better with a different method. So that's what you as a teacher can do. Then we look at the visual spatial problems. These are children with difficulty writing numbers and symbols and misaligned numbers in columns in order. Now, teachers, you and you do come across this, especially when children are at still their foundation learning how to write correctly. Uh, you, you understand they misalign the numbers. So teachers have a role as well to assist such learners. And how do you as, as a teacher? help a learner overcome such a learning difficulty. You provide prompts or cues. Using finger spaces, for instance, between sums. Teach a child, put the finger space between your sums, you put the finger space. All this is demonstrated in, your, in our study guides, so you can just go through as to how, how to do it practically. So it's a visual spatial problem, but all problems can be overcome in mathematics. Then lastly, we have the problem-solving difficulties. These are children with problems identifying the type of problem and may have trouble deciding where to start when attempting to solve a problem, more or less like the procedural pro problem. Now here, what can you as a teacher do if you have a child who have a problem just to identify where to start or what to do? Try to use language that is appropriate for their learners. In your presentation, in your lesson, Already from the introduction, use terminologies that are very familiar with the learners. A language that will be very at their level, not their level of understanding, so that you use such language to them. And then use contexts familiar to learners as well. It's more similar, the same. You must use context that is very familiar to the learner. Remember what is familiar to one, to, 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 one, to, to, to one learner may not be familiar to the other. So you must try to know in your class group what, is, what contexts are familiar to this learner, then apply them. Without wasting time, let's move on to Unit 2. Under Unit 2, we have five subtopics. And from here and there, I'll pick a thing or two. But please, again, I repeat, go through every subtopic in your study guides. It's an exam, remember. Important factors to be considered when planning a lesson. Planning a mathematics lesson to ensure learning support. Now, what are the important factors that you need to consider? Learners' previous knowledge. Materials, class ability and experience. Difficulty in teaching and learning the topic. Now, those are the four that we can browse through. Learners' previous knowledge is an important factor to consider when you're planning a lesson. The materials you need for the lesson. The class ability and experience, difficulty in teaching. I'll go through each of them. Learners' previous knowledge. In mathematics, prerequisite knowledge is very, very important. You need to understand what to build on, meaning you must know what children already know. What knowledge do they have before you build on it? So, therefore, you as a teacher, it's important now to identify their prior knowledge for a new topic to be understood. If you want them to understand the new topic, please try to know the learner's previous knowledge. That is their prerequisite knowledge so that you can be able to build on what they know. Next is materials. Materials needed for a lesson should be prepared well in advance, well in advance, so that you may not end up having a shortcoming coming of materials or so that you may not have the wrong materials for the lesson. So try to prepare materials well in advance. 
And then class ability and experience. The range and ability of the, of the experience in the class will guide the depth, speed, and approach. Meaning, the class ability, you must be able to know your learner's ability. Mixed ability classes, they usually have challenges into coming up with a lesson plan that can cater for all learners of all abilities. So therefore, it's very good as a, as a teacher when you are planning your lesson so that you know what speed at what speed you present your lesson, the approach you choose, and how deep you go into the lesson. So that's class ability. Then we have difficulty in teaching and learning the topic. Now, understanding of the topic is very important when planning a lesson. So you need to understand the topic very well as a teacher before you present the lesson. This will help you avoid confuse the learners. Some teachers, because they lack the understanding of the topic, they end up confusing the learners more instead of helping them understand the topic. Next, let's look at the factors to take into account when deciding how to teach a topic. What factors do you need to put into account? The best approach for your class. Number one. Second, the key questions for the lesson. Number three, areas that may be difficult to explain. Number four, difficulties the learners may experience. So all those factors, one must put them into account when you, are, when you decide to teach a topic. So the best approach for your class, know what, if you are using internet resources, for instance, you must look at what is relevant. From that internet, look at what is relevant for your learners. You identify the approach that will work best for your, for your class. And then you consider that. So some lessons are developed overseas and what works best for an American learner may not work best for an Indian learner. So that's why you need to identify the approach for your class before you start with your lesson. And then the key question for the lesson. You must identify the key question that you aim to answer at the end of the lesson. So try at least, I mean, during the lesson. So have your key question already. What is the aim? What do you want to answer during this lesson? Have it already when you are, when you decide to teach that topic. And then areas that may, that may be difficult to explain so that you may go through, ask for guidance, ask for suggestions. So you must already know that this part of the topic is may be very difficult to explain. So you as a teacher, you need to understand the topic you need to understand the topic or that subtopic very, very well before you start your lesson. Difficulties the learners may experience. You must identify the difficult components. Why? Because you end up spending more time on those components that learners may experience difficulty with. We proceed. I'll just list a few elements to be included in any lesson plan. I think we should. We should be familiar with this by now. That's how I'll just list for you. The lesson objectives, potential difficulties, materials and equipment needed, lesson outline, learner evaluation, lesson evaluation. All those elements should be part of your lesson plan when you are planning a lesson. Then we move on. Benefits of using games in a mathematical classroom. What do we benefit when we engage games? in our lessons, when we make games part of our lesson. They are enjoyable, number one, so learners will not be bored during your lesson. They make revision interesting. Lessable learners are more actively involved. Mental maths can be improved through games. Teach concepts in the language of mathematics. Games can improve communication skills. Games provide a platform of creativity because they end up being creative as they take part in these games. And then um, we look at the purposes of questioning in mathematic lesson. Purposes of questioning. Why do we question during a mathematic lesson? It's to help learners to learn. When you are asking them, they are learning. To enable learners to overcome difficulties. If the child have a difficulty and you ask them something, they overcome that. To renew previous work and evaluate progress. To control and organize the class. In that way, through questioning, you are organizing the class. You are identifying that this part of the class do not understand this, or I must 
again revise on this one. So you are having control of the class and you're also organizing the class in one way or another. And then uh, quickly, I want us also to look at the broad groups questions can be categorized into. Questions can be categorized into different broad groups. What are those? We have the recall questions. We have the convergent thinking questions. And we have the divergent thinking questions. The difference, the recall questions require learners to recall something from memory, just what they remember. That's it. It's normally a fact or just a definition if they remember. That's a recall question. A convergent thinking question requires convergent thinking. This uses a higher level of memory than recall. Question. Learner must combine given and remembered information to come to an answer. Before a learner answer, a child is able to remember something and combine it with that they have been given for them to be able to come to a conclusion to answer a question. And the divergent thinking, these are the open-ended questions and promote discussions. They require learners to be original and to think for themselves. These are now the divergent thinking questions, the level three, what we, what we know is the level three. They think for themselves. They have to be as original as possible. Then categories of answers. Now from the questionings, we move on to the answers. How do we categorize answers? We have the road answers and we have the rational answers. And what is the difference between the two? Road answers involve retrieving a fact from memory and relaying this fact in answer to a question. And what is the rational answer? It requires consideration and thought. You must think and you must consider before you just answer. That is rational. Okay, um, let's move on to unit three. Here, unit three, I'll just touch one or two things. You can see our subtopics are a lot. It's all seven. Please go through each one of them. Number sense, cardinal and ordinal numbers. What are the different? What is the difference between the cardinal and the ordinal numbers? These are numbers. The cardinal numbers are numbers that specify the size of a set. What do we mean by that? The last number when you say something, when you are counting, is the number of the objects in the set. When you are counting, and the last number that you say, it specifies the size of the set, meaning is a number of the size within that set. Meaning, if you are counting one, two, three, four, it means there are four objects in that set. That's what it means. And the ordinal numbers, these are numbers that specify the position or relative size of an object in a set. If you count first, second, third, we are counting learners in a class. First, second, third. It does not necessarily mean that there are three children in the class. It means that is the third, is the position of the child. There may be more, but you counted up to the third child. So meaning you specify the position of an object in a set. Good, and then let's look at the types of pothole relations students that need to be familiar with. What are those pothole relations that students need to be familiar with? They are very, very well explained in the module. I like the explanation in your study guide. So please go through it. Parts of holes. Division of groups into parts, and then divisions of whole things into parts. And this is the foundation of mathematics. Part whole relations, division. It's more or less like division. It's just another word. Learners will be familiar with the word division. So it's parts of a whole, meaning holes are made up of different parts, like puzzles, a pizza or something. Then we have division of groups into parts. You divide different groups into different parts. And then we have divisions of whole things into parts. They are well, well explained in our study guides. Let's move on to unit four. Concepts applied in mathematics through dramatic play. I would like us to start with the dramatic play because I'll just list through. One-to-one -one correspondence, sets and classifying, counting, comparing and measuring, spatial relations and volume concepts, and then number symbols. All these are the concepts that we apply in mathematics when we are doing play, drama, dramatic play. And then uh, terminologies, very interesting. Students, please, when you are starting with your module, have a list of terms that you need to understand from that module. All the terminology that you need to understand, as this will help you describe or explain certain things. If you understand the term, the meaning of the word. Ordering, the practice of, or, of arranging objects according to a given criteria. Patterning, 
the practice of arranging objects in a repeating pattern. Simple patterns, repeating objects or shapes, repeating patterns. Simple patterns. Number patterns. Patterns where there is a constant relationship, constant relationship between each number in the pattern. Like two, four, six, eight. Can you see there is a constant relationship which is add to to add to, to the previous to get the next? That is what we mean by number patterns. It's patterns where there is a constant relationship between each number in the pattern. Sequence, it concerns the order of events and is related to the process of ordering. Then we have duration, relates to how long an event takes place. All these are simple terminologies. And you come across students who either confuse the terms or I, I really do not know how you, but as I said, it's very important for you from the beginning of the module, of the unit that you are studying. Highlight a few terminologies that you should know and understand. Then let's look at the money-based activities. Oh, how can you, as a teacher, develop learning of measurement with money for pre-primary and primary learners? How can you use certain, use certain measurement concepts for money-based activities now? But remember the age, pre-primary learners and primary learners. So your activities should be of that category. Comparing prices is one of the activity. Wages, salaries, currency, and budgets. Now, come up with ideas as to how can you, as a teacher, develop the learning of measurement using these money-based activities, comparing prices in your classroom. How would you, how would you come up with a, an activity of how learners should compare prices? Maybe you can choose your class, divide your class into different, different groups as shops. Then you say compare prices of the same item but in different sizes. Wages and salaries. Ask learners what they want to be. And then give them a salary rate or something. And then you, are, you compare their salaries, which, which career earns more than the other one. Those are all type of activities. Currency. Now look at this age, for instance, pre-primary learners. What can they do with currency? So you can... You, you definitely, definitely you cannot go into depth with the currency, but you can at least teach them the more or less. Which currency have more of the value? Just there, don't go into depth, please. Budgets, assume, ask your learners, assume they have a $10 each, 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 and then give them a list of what they have to buy. Then they must budget for you, so that you can see if they do not go beyond $10, you teach them. These are the basics, that's what we mean by how can you as a teacher develop learning of measurement? They are measuring, but using money-based activities. All these activities, all these are money-based activities. So just using that. Let's move on to unit five. We have using graphs to represent data, working with percentages, introducing decimal system, learning about angles, using metric system for measurement calculations. Please, you see that is a lot. Um, but I will take out what I feel is important for now. But for your exam, go through every subunit that you see there. Every subunit, please pick something. Pick one thing or two from each subunit. Unit five, we look at the importance of graphs as tools for representing data. Why are graphs important to represent data? Graphs, they display findings in a visual format. A lot of information can be condensed into one graph. You have so much information, but all that information is just represented into one simple bar graph or line graph or pictograph or whatever. So that's a very good uh, uh, importance there. And then displaying data visually makes it easy to identify the trends and make comparisons simply by looking at the graph. You don't need to calculate, but you can already see that this color blue is more than color red because of the way the bar graph, the color blue bar graph is longer than the other one. So you don't even need to do any calculations. You just read off the graph. So visually, seeing it visually on a graph makes it very, very, very easy for someone to make comparisons or identify the trends. Okay, we move on. Benefits of using decimals over fractions. Why is it beneficial to use decimals instead of fractions? That's what, they, that's what it means. Decimals are more closely related to the metric system than fractions. 
Example, if you have 4.4 centimeters, it's a decimal number. This tells us that 5 centimeters, the 5 is a centimeter, the point separates the centimeter and the what? The millimeter. So 5.4 centimeter means 5 centimeter and 4 millimeter. That's what it means. So that we mean by it, they are more closely related to the metric system. And then calculations on computers and calculators are more easily managed when Elena is working with decimals rather than traditional fractions. Money is expressed using decimals, and so it is important for learners to master working with decimals. So those are the benefits of why decimals are of more use than using fractions, why it's important to use decimals over fractions. Let's look at the potential, uh, potential conceptual difficulties that teachers need to be aware of when teaching decimals to primary learners. We have two potential conceptual difficulties here. Misunderstanding the decimal point is one, and transferring whole numbers properties to decimals is another one. It's a second one. Now, what is the misunderstanding of the decimal point? Children do not realize that the decimal point separates whole numbers from parts of a whole. Children often interpret the numbers after the decimal point as a whole number instead of a number less than one. So that's the misunderstanding of the decimal point. All this has to do with the decimal point. Then we look at the transferring whole numbers properties to decimals. Often, whole numbers properties relating to magnitude are incorrectly to decimals. Often, whole number properties relating to magnitude are incorrectly Two decimals. Please, that is a transferring of a whole number property to a decimal. That's what it means. And then we also have learners who believe that the longer the number is, if a decimal number is very long, then they assume that's the larger number. 0 0.234. Elena will see it as a larger number than 0 0.1. So that is also a transferring of whole number properties to decimal. So those are the challenges that we have, potential misconceptual difficulties that learners tend to experience. So therefore, it's important for teachers to be aware of those two. Uh, common problems learners have when working with angles. The line segment length is equated to magnitude of the angle. Different orientations that are seen as different angles. Learners will see this orientation as different to an angle. Because they see the, if, they, if, if it's long, then they think it is, it is bigger than it's, it's, the, the, that angle is bigger. Incorrect placing of the protractor. These are things that can be overcome by teaching the learners practically how to demonstrate on the chalkboard. And then incorrect reading of the protractor. Again, this is the teacher's task so that you make sure learners are aware not to experience such a problem when you are teaching your angles already know that that's expect that these are the type of problems learners experience so that you can include the, the, the interventions already in your lesson. Let's move on to unit six. Unit six, um, let's look at the commercial mathematic materials. What type of commercial mathematic materials can you as a teacher um, plan to have as materials in your lesson preparations. We have a long list in our study guides. Beads and strings, clocks, unit blocks, thermometers, scales, calculators, fraction pies, three-dimensional shapes, and then the Lego building blocks, which works very, very, very well for the pre-primary learners. Next, how to use, how to store math mathematic uh, materials in the classroom? How do you store the math materials? The materials, where do you keep them for the next year or for the following year for future? How to store them? How do you store them? Where to store them? Materials should be neatly organized, number one, because you need them for future. Shoe boxes are a cheap way. They're a cheap alternative to have shoe boxes. It's cheap to have them. Ask a children to bring a shoe, an empty shoe box. Then boxes must be clearly marked as you know what goes into which box. When you mark, you know. If you say these are cans, uh, top cans or these are uh, strings or these are uh, beads, mark it so that the learners know where to put what. Then keep an inventory list outside of each box so you, so you know when one is missing. It's very, when you have an inventory, you should be able 
to take control of what is missing from what. It's very important. Okay, next we have guidelines for planning outdoor learning activities. These are five. Prepare learners before taking them outside. Plan your lesson. We all, we all know why we need to plan our lesson before we take our learners outside so that there's order and they know what to do. Decide how you will evaluate learners learning. You can't go decide outside. You must do it already before they go outside there. Create links between context and then be as flexible as you can. So before when you are planning an outdoor activity, those are the guidelines that you should follow. Effective methods of communicating with parents, newsletter, informal note, homework diary, personal letter, email, phone call, face-to-face -face meeting. Telling a child to go pass on a message to a parent, please. Such things are not effective. That's why we say we do have effective methods of communicating with parents, the ones that I just highlighted above there. Now, guidelines on how to provide learning experiences at home, very important. Children learn through repetition. And this requires patience and encouragement. They are just children, please. You need to be as patient as possible. You need to encourage them. So through repetition, they will master. Adults should use the language of mathematics when discussing everyday activities with children. So be able to watch what language we are using. Homework should be viewed as an important part of children's play as well. Then lastly, I would like us to go through Unit 7. It's Unit 7, it's about assessment, where we look at the types of assessment, homework as effective learning support, setting mathematics tests, preparing learners for examinations, assessing developmental progress, and interpreting results and performance. Let's go through the first two types of assessment. We have the formative assessment and we have a summative assessment. What is the difference between the two? Formative is used throughout the year to assess whether a learner is attaining the necessary skills and knowledge. It provides feedback on a learner's progress. Now, what are the examples of this formative assessment? These are the classwork, the homework, the assignments, or the projects. That is formative. Now, what is summative? Summative is done at the end of the year or semester. It usually sums up what the learners have learned throughout the whole course. And then it takes place after the learning has been completed when you are done. Unlike the formative, which takes place during the lesson, Summative takes place after the whole learning process has been completed. It provides information and feedback that sums up the teaching and learning. Now, what are the examples of this summative assessment? Summative is an example of a final or NDA exam or end of term topic test or projects, portfolios, chapter tests, whatever you can name it. All those are the examples. Now, secondly, let's look at the guidelines now for managing homework as assessment. Remember, homework can also be, it's also an assessment. You can assess learners through homework because this will guide you to know if this topic is well understood or not. Must I redo it? You need to represent this topic or what do you do? Now, what are the guidelines that you as a teacher needs to manage? Manage the difficulty level. Mostly, Question paper should consist of the average. And then with a few easy questions and a few challenging questions. But average should be most of it. Then collect or check homework. This will also give you a guideline as to, or it will give you an idea of what topic to emphasize on or to redo. Keep records. Records will really help you as to where, where, where to focus on when you are doing revision for the exam, for instance. Homework can guide you that before you give a test, this subtopic was not well understood. Let me. So you go back to your records. And then vary homework activities. Some homework can be a project done outside the classroom or at home, outside the go give your learners a task to go in somewhere and count how many cars are passing by in so much time and so on. So those are the guidelines that for managing homework as assessment, how to manage homework as an assessment. So that should guide you. Then let's look at the criteria to be adhered to by teachers when setting our mathematics tests. Remember mathematics, that's not just any test. Levels should be appropriate. Question types should be familiar to the learners. Don't ask learners of, of things they have never experienced before. No, please. 
language should be clear mark allocation should be clear and must reflect also time allocation don't give learners a test of 50 marks to do in 30 minutes for instance no the two the mark allocation and time allocation should correlate progress to more challenging questions start with easier questions before you go to the more challenging questions if a child starts with a challenging question, the child will spend the whole period there and they're trying to think. So, and it also loses their confidence in answering your test. So, progress to more challenging questions. Check your test and memorandum. We can make mistakes. So, when you are done setting up, check everything just to make sure that they are the same or they are all in order. And lastly, students... I would like us to look at why frequent short tests are better than long ones. And you need to know this before you go out in the field day. Why are frequent short tests long, better? Why are they better than the long ones? Short tests are not too stressful for learners. Remember, the longer, they lose concentration very fast. So short tests, they are not stressful. Frequent tests, which are short, Ensure that learners are revising work constantly. Short tests can focus on one specific topic, making it easier to identify where a learner may have a problem. Then last, frequent tests, meaning the short tests, mean that there is time for intervention before high stakes testing such as an exam. If you are giving a lot of frequent short tests, you have ample time for interventions. That this test was performed very poor. You still have time. Instead of teach, 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 and then come give a long, long test, and then it's already exams. You won't have time to go back to the corrections so that you can redo correction properly with the learners. So that's what it means. So students, as I said, please, I've just gone through a few subtopics, not everything. So... so I urge you, remember, I urge you to go through everything. The presentation is only a guideline and not an exam paper or a scope. This means that not everything in the exam is in the presentation. Therefore, study as much as you can from all learning outcomes. From all learning outcomes, study as much as you can. This presentation only covers both April, August, and November exams. So therefore, you need to study everything you are required to do not limit yourself because of this class or contact class please do as much as you can i wish you all the best with your examination and if you feel there's a topic that you still need to understand further please do contact me on 081 you contact me if you need further explanation on any part I may not have covered or I may have covered but you may not have understood it very well. I thank you.